let's hit it. And welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I hope you enjoyed our opening music. It's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band featuring Maya Dore, a local band here in Minnesota that I think is just fabulous. And you can go ahead and download that song on any of your favorite music platforms if you'd like. For those of you that are new to Alzheimer Speaks, we are a radio show that's true talk. We are about sound information, not just sound bites. We like to raise voices large and small all around the world regarding dementia and caregiving. So maybe, just maybe, you can be our next guest. Now today we're doing something a little bit different and I'm so proud that we are partnering with the Roseville Alzheimer's and Dementia Community Action Team, which they provide a, a ton of information to caregivers and people living with dementia here in Roseville, Minnesota. But we have started a special series with them called Dementia Caring and Coping During the Pandemic, where we highlight a lot of businesses and um, raising awareness of what all they have to offer people. So um, before I do that, I want to again always thank our listeners. Your likes, your clicks, your shares are so precious and I really do appreciate them very much. I always like to give a couple of shout outs and so two I want to give out to right away are Arthur's uh, Senior Care which allows me to facilitate two memory cafes for them on the second and the fourth Wednesday of each month or go to the memorycafedirectory.com that lists all memory cafes around the world, along with those that have become virtual. And to find the virtual ones, go to Cafe Connect tab on the Memory Cafe directory to find those um, in particular. I also want to give a shout out to Dementia Map, a global resource directory, which serves those living with dementia, their families, um, and care partners, as well as individuals and organizations in trying to find anything and everything dementia and caregiving related. Need to also shout out to Coral Health. They are so kind to allow people still during COVID to download two of their music apps. One is called Music First. The other is Coral Faith. Just go to corohealth.com to find that. Now let's hear from the foot bar walker and we'll be right back to learn about the Roseville Alzheimer's and Dementia Caring and Coping series for today. Introducing the life-changing foot bar walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The foot bar walker revolutionized my care of George. It absolutely benefits the patient and the caregiver both, and that's the beauty of it. It's so easy to use. It folds up just like a dream. I got it in and out of the car without any effort at all. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle? to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the Foot Bar Walker. Well, welcome back. Today we are going to be talking with Bonnie Jaffe, who is an RN and has been with the Jewish Family Services of St. Paul since 2008. And she has served in a variety of roles there. Currently, she leads the Senior Care Services Programs that helps elders and people with disabilities age in place through care planning and coordination. 
She has worked with all forms of dementia and is trained as a dementia friends facilitator. Bonnie is trained in the powerful tools for caregivers, reach community for caregivers, honoring choices of Minnesota to help people complete their advanced directives. And she also is currently leading uh, JFS to assist Holocaust survivors gain access to services from the Claims Conference. That is a conference on Jewish material claims against Germany. So welcome, Bonnie. Well, Bonnie, I am so thrilled to have you with us today. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Um, thank you. Now, to start, I always ask all of my guests if they have been personally touched by dementia in their own family or circle of friends. Do you mind sharing that with us? I wouldn't say my family has had any dementia so far, but um, I have had some friends that have had dementia. So... It is very familiar to me on a personal level. Okay, thanks for sharing. It always just gives people a, just a little personal background on, on where you're coming from with things. So let's talk about starting with telling us maybe about the mission of your organization and how that relates to dementia and caregiving. Okay, so the mission for Jewish Family Service is that it's inspired by Jewish values. So Jewish Family Service helps people and their families build on their strengths, develop the skills and confidence to meet life's challenges with dignity. A Jewish Family Service was founded in 1911 and um, we serve all people. Uh, a lot of times people will say, oh, you're Jewish Family Service, so maybe I can't come there because I, I'm not Jewish, but just the opposite. We serve everybody. And as far as dementia caregiving, it's a very, it can be a very full-time job. So our goal is to support the caregiver and provide tools so that they can care for themselves while doing probably one of the hardest jobs they've ever done in their lives. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I have to say, um, you guys do just such a spectacular job with your communities and your outreach. I'm not Jewish, but I, you know, I've um, partaken in a few things and just been really impressed with how you work uh, with everybody. So thank you for that. Given COVID and all the restrictions, and it's hard to believe it's, you know, coming up on a year that this has really impacted us once the, the regulations kind of came in force. How have you had to adjust your offerings with caregivers and people living with dementia? So, of course, in the beginning of COVID, we totally decided to go into only at-home work mode. So we closed our offices right away and we communicated with our clients to make sure that they understood that we're still there, we're available by phone, we're available by email. And then we reassured them that they would continue getting their services. The form might take a quite a bit different way of, of providing the service, like assessments, for instance. We were always used to doing in, you know, face-to-face -face assessments. So that would be done either by phone or it would be done on a Zoom call or some other platform. We weren't sure at that time it was, it was at the beginning of the pandemic. I think that most of all, it was just being in contact with our clients. I was in contact with my clients weekly. So, and programs did change over time. Can you tell us a little bit about how programs changed? We were planning on doing a Powerful Tools program, and we had to sort of put that on the shelf because Powerful Tools wasn't up to speed yet on how they were going to change it to a remote way of providing that class. So therefore, we sort of put ours on hold so that we could make sure that we were up to date on how to provide that. And can you tell people what Powerful Tools is? Powerful Tools for Caregivers is a program where we help caregivers learn. It's a very scripted program, but we learn they learn how to take care of themselves first so that they have the energy, the emotional energy, physical energy to take care of their loved ones with dementia. Okay, wonderful. And did that did were you able to eventually 
do that program then? Did they kind of pivot to and pass that along to you? They passed it along. And actually, we are just going to have our first powerful tools on February 2nd. Okay. Okay. So, wow. I bet people are excited to kind of get that back and play again. I think they are. And I was very cautious about how optimistic we should be about people signing up. But actually, we've had quite a few signups for that program. Well, I think people have really adapted to being able to meet virtually and are really excited, actually, that they can meet virtually, that they've, you know, figured this out over, over a period of time. What other types of things have you had to pivot in terms, to, in terms of adjusting for your services? I've had to pivot lots of things. Um, so actually, the face-to-face -face meetings became now meetings over the phone, or they became virtual meetings over Zoom. And then much of my work was about taking people to appointments and advocating for them. So of course, in the beginning of COVID, we could not do that. And that still remains the case that all case managers at Jewish Family Service are not going out to see clients. So what I had to adjust to was getting my clients to an important appointment and then talking to staff and saying, okay, now you have to include me virtually in this appointment. It was a big learning curve from the beginning because the healthcare systems weren't used to this to begin with, just like we weren't used to it and they had to come up to speed. Therefore, we had to come up to speed along with them so that we could serve our clients. So that was kind of an interesting uh, reassessments. We continue to do you know, virtually now clients that I have in the community that have caregivers at home, you know, there's an advantage and a disadvantage. So in the beginning, I was, I was very scared for my clients that had caregivers because I wanted to make sure that were all the rules being followed by this other agency that's providing caregivers to my clients. And so then I had to work more closely with the home care company that I use to make sure that indeed they're masking, they're washing their hands. Um, if somebody traveled, what was that gonna look like so that my clients wouldn't get sick? How it all evolved in the past months, I think people are less scared. Um, you're able to get to the doctor's appointments. If, it, if it's an important appointment, they get there. And sometimes with the help of an A or a family member, and then I can sit in on the appointment through Doxy or different platforms, whichever health system it is, they all have different platforms. And people have become used to me saying, I have to be at this appointment with the client, so let me in. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I know health partners, I work very closely with health partners, aging and memory department, I think they know me a little bit. And so I'm able to sit in on some of those vows. Yeah, I, I would think that, I mean, cause they're all adapting too to this whole telehealth thing and you know, what it's all about. But yeah, when you, when you step in and that's your responsibility, they got to let you in there. It wasn't always so easy though, because they, like I said, their systems were undergoing their own changes, which were very uncomfortable for me doing my work. Mm -hmm. um, they went from me being able to call an Alina clinic in a neighborhood and get to that Alina clinic, for instance, or a health partners clinic, to a centralized system where they sent all calls to a central system. And then you just had these people that really, really had no idea how to help you. And then I had to learn how to work around that. Oh yeah, those centralized systems. I don't care for those. I mean, you can you just get looped and looped and they have their standard questions and they don't, they're like bots almost, you know, even though they're live people on the other end um, sometimes and you just, you can't get through. So I can see where that would be frustrating, but I'm, I'm glad you've been able to, to adapt through that. Now is the REACH program, is, is that where you assist people who have caregivers at home or what is that program? So the REACH program is also, again, a scripted program where we help people at home. So 
in the day before COVID, we would go out for four or five meetings with a family member, or they would come to us, whatever was most convenient. And we would go through different areas where caregivers were having a hard time. And we would assist them to figure out strategies so that we could resolve some of those issues. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually a very good program. Uh, one of the programs that I, I have, that have, has sort of boomed a little bit for me right now is one-to-one -one caregiver support. People have called me and said, you know, I, I, I'm the caregiver of such and such who has dementia and I need help. What I will do if it's an individual is I'll offer one-to-one -one caregiver support. We have funding from the MAAA grant. And it's wonderful. I can actually spend an hour and talk to the person about their situation, figure out goals. And we usually do some short-term planning just for the week or two weeks, depending on how often they want to meet. That works out really well. And I've had clients for a few months already through COVID taking advantage of, of that program. That's very, very helpful. Yeah, it's really hard, especially because so many of the adult days and the respite programs have gone aside. And so now it's it's very confining and really overwhelming to to so many to not have that little bit of escape that you don't even realize how much you need it until it's not there anymore. True. Um, or, or the support um, itself. Now, you also work with Honoring Choices of Minnesota. Can you tell people a little bit about that as well and how that's sure. in COVID? Honoring Choices, really, what we started out to do was we would meet clients in the office or even in their home and go through planning, helping them plan their advanced directives. At this point in time, I haven't had anybody virtually do that. But it would be the same process virtually. The most important decision for people, I think, is figuring out who you want to speak for you if you're not able to speak for yourself for advanced directives. And then we fill out the paperwork, which is pretty uncomplicated. We can add anything into the paperwork that you want. It's not cut and dry you want to be resuscitated, you don't want to be resuscitated. You could you could add different elements in that are your preferences. Okay. Yeah. And that's just such an important piece. And I think it's gotten even more important with COVID because you just, you don't know who's next. Now, I also mentioned um, in your intro that you are a Dementia Friends facilitator. How is that going at this point? Are they able to do much with the Dementia Friendly group? I think that sort of has taken a bit of a back burner. There's one other person at Jewish Family Service who does Dementia Friends, and I didn't check in with her to see if she's done anything with it this year, but I have a sense not so much. It would not be hard, but I think there's been so much adjusting to just our own work mm -hmm. that going to the outer community and training let's say the fire department or stores, which haven't really been open, has, I think, taken a back, a back seat at this point. But hopefully with the vaccine, that will all come back. Yeah. Well, and for those of you that don't know, Dementia Friends is usually through dementia-friendly communities and groups. And pretty much everybody on those teams are volunteers from other communities that are getting hit really hard in terms of coping and adjusting in healthcare. And so that, that makes perfect sense. I'm really interested in hearing what you are doing with Holocaust survivors. We have survivors that are part of Jewish Family Service. And what I do is I take the lead on making sure that they get services from the claims conference from the German government. And these services are usually home care services. So if let's say somebody was a survivor who survived uh, concentration camps. They're sort of at the top and they get the most amount of hours of care. And then there's two other tiers down and they're also survivors, but they've suffered a bit. Trauma is trauma, it's all traumatic, mm -hmm. but they've suffered in diff other different ways. So they might only qualify for 
a few less hours than the amount of hours that somebody has been in a concentration camp. Basically, I set up services with the home care agency for them to help them. And that has been such a blessing during COVID. Wonderful. Because I feel that they are well taken care of in the community and they're able to live in their own homes. And that is one of my main jobs is working with people to make sure that they can age in place, Holocaust survivor or not. Wonderful. So you guys do a lot, uh, you know, a big variety of activities. Is there anything else that we haven't covered that you, that you provide? Well, yeah, I guess there's one other activity that I personally provide. I provide a fee for service care coordination. This service is for clients and families if they want ongoing support. So each client is unique and goals are set according to each person's individual needs. Examples would be that a family member comes to me and is sure that their father needs like an assisted living setting. So I help explore why the family feels this way and look at possible services that we can put in place in the home first so that the client is comfortable and we allay the fears of the family. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting the client's medication set up in a pill pack because they can no longer remember how to set the pills up in containers. That's just one example of of how I do care coordination for my clients. The last piece of my work is care planning meetings. So sometimes people will call me up and say, we don't know what to do. I had a recent call from somebody who said, we don't know what to do with my mother. She's not herself. And they couldn't be really, really specific. And there were several siblings. So I said, since there are several, would you like to have a care planning meeting? And they agreed, and we charge a certain small fee for that meeting. It's an hour-long meeting. I get to pull in all the information and look at everything and give them recommendations about what they, different directions they can go. So in some ways, it's almost a mediating, you know, all of the, sometimes I would imagine drama that can come in play with families when they're not all in sync as well. <laughs> It's, part, it's partly that, but it's also partly giving them an idea of wh which way they could go. And also some people from that perspective choose a more specific care coordination for me. And then some people think, well, maybe they really need some one-to-one -one caregiver support. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, which is not the work I'm doing right now, I can send them to one of my other uh, colleagues who does the caregiver support group twice a month, second and fourth Monday of the month in the afternoon. I'm not sure exactly what time, but she runs that group. Okay. I was, that was one of the questions I was going to ask is if your organization does have support groups and if so, what kind of support groups? It is the caregiver support group. And then I personally run the grief support group with a colleague at Shalom Home East and West. We co-facilitate that group twice a month on the second, second and fourth Wednesday of the month. Okay. And that group is the one that I'm responsible for. Okay. Do you do anything like with the memory cafes at all? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. But I know that our organization in Minneapolis, Jewish Family and Children's Services are starting at CAFE right now. Wonderful. So, yeah, mm -hmm. well, they'll have to make sure that they get on the Memory CAFE directory for that. That's a free listing to, to get on. And same with your services, Dementia Map is also a, a free resource, or it can be a paid level too, depending on what you're looking for there to help people be able to find find services these days. What kind of feedback have you been getting from like family and, and clients with dementia during this process? Are they feeling how the organization is adapted, is meeting their needs? I mean, are they understanding or are they like, I just need more help. I want it back the way it was. <laughs> I think people are feeling better these days. I think in the beginning, it was really confusing. It was confusing for everybody. They need a lot of reassurance, but you know, our staff are all really warm and caring and it's encouraged in our JFS culture to go out of our way to make sure that 
we comfort our clients and families the best that we are able. And I think people are doing pretty well. Good, good. What have been like the biggest challenges for families and for your staff? So the biggest challenge to start with was wrapping our mind around no more seeing our clients in person. Personally, I loved my work so much because I was always able to see my clients weekly at appointments. I was able to assess their needs. My biggest strength looking back at it all was that I'm good at visualizing things. And, you know, as a nurse, you learn to use all of your senses. But as a person, we all know that we we always depend on one particular sense more than the other. So this was a huge task personally, professionally, that I learned to use every sense. Like a blind person, their hearing will be much more acute. Uh, A deaf person, their their visual sense will be more acute. So it's the same thing. I had to learn that I had to like pull out all the, all the stops and say, listen really carefully, stop and just, you can't put your hands on that person. You can't necessarily see them through the phone. So you need to listen for all the little details. You need to ask others who are caring for them what's going on. And it was also dependent being interdependent with other people, other staff, doctors, other nurses. Uh, so it was, it was quite a challenge. We, you know, we communicate so much non-verbally and try to be able to pick all that stuff up. And I know a lot of people say, oh, you can't pick that up on, on a Zoom meeting or video. But I know people with dementia will argue that point. When they're in their support groups, they love being able to connect via Zoom because telephone doesn't really work for a lot of them. They need the visuals. They need to read the lips. They need to go. And are those words really matched in the body language here? What's going on? And, you know, they've developed a really close friendship. So I think it has made us all be forced to be a little more present when we're there. And then also appreciate what we've lost during this period Because I think it's one of those things we take for granted that we just get to see and touch people and all of those things, our freedom of being able to roam around and then really looking at having to focus inward on big picture matters here. We have to protect us all. And so it's, I think it's been interesting from what I've seen from both families and staff in terms of the whole pivot mode and realizing that not just families sometimes get depressed, but sometimes the workers do too, because they're adapting and adjusting and are feeling losses, even though they're busier than ever with those things, making us feel all a little bit more alike than, than different. What do you think the future holds for your organization and what have you learned from COVID? At this time, we're, we're planning to continue all of our services to caring for our clients with dementia and their caregivers. All other services will also continue through t- 2021. The ability to work remotely will likely be with us for some time to come. <laughs> we will continue to use all of our tools and our toolbox to make this as seamless as possible. I think that the last many months has been a huge learning curve for all of us at JFS, myself as well, and our clients. So remote delivery plans will continue to be used and hopefully new and easier plans can be developed to meet the needs of people with dementia going forward. Yeah, definitely is going to be needed. That's for sure. What kind of advice do you have for somebody who's living with dementia right now? I guess my advice is, I mean, I've seen definitely some more decline in some of my clients with dementia because they're more isolated and and they're isolated at home or in facilities. So I encourage families to try their best. I know this seems maybe a bit trite, but get your family member outside if you can, even for 15 minutes, if it's cold, really cold, five minutes on a porch, on a step anywhere, just so that they can take in the world and take in the smells and the scent, listening to the birds or anything that's out there, get some sunshine. Uh, If they're able to walk safely, go and get a walk for a few minutes. I have a client that lives in assisted living and his son calls every day and plays uh, old time music for him. 
And that's really, it's been a wonderful thing for that person. So figure out what your loved one likes. What were they like? What, what activities did they like? And try to bring it to life. I had one gentleman with dementia who loved fishing. Well, you know, we couldn't take him fishing necessarily in the middle of the winter. You could go ice fishing in Minnesota, but we ended up setting up a fish tank for him in his home. And that was just a really nice thing. It was life. It was life affirming and it was not hard to do. I love to help people figure out what activities they could enjoy with their loved one in, in the home. I always joke that I really should have been an occupational therapist, not a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> I think those are some things that, you know, looking at beautiful pictures, phone calls, whatever it is that can help, you know, these really long days. Yeah. And they can't be long. I'm going to give a plug to um, Maria's place. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they have all kinds of activities that are free mm -hmm. that people can scope through. It could be anything from an exercise to meditation to something spiritual to arts and crafts. They'll even give you a shopping list of what you need. They have videos of how to adapt to different stages. So it's really a, a cool, cool thing. How about for other organizations? Any advice for them? I think it's important. Sometimes I would get so ingrained in my own work that I would forget to look around at what are other agencies doing in your area? Look at other nonprofits in your area and see what they're doing. What, what are they offering? If people are computer savvy, that's great. We can do it that way. There's people that are not computer savvy. We have a lot of older adults, whether it be the caregivers or their family members that have dementia. A wonderful resource is Senior Linkage Line to get some ideas. I have to say that it sort of makes me laugh because I think people have to figure out where they, they are in which generation, because right now I'm in a generation where I always use the telephone. Mm -hmm. And if you would ask somebody in a younger generation, like my daughter, who's 27, she would say, don't call me, just text me. <laughs> And they don't answer their phones. I had a client recently who had dementia for five years, and she had started out with myocognitive delay. By the time I met her, she had progressed to a moderate place in her dementia. Her daughter was dead set on me using Alexa for her. And she programmed it initially, and she wanted me to put all the appointments in there, the medical appointments, everything. Well, it came to be that my client could not remember to say, Alexa, what's on my calendar today? I had to cajole this client's daughter to say, your mom is in a different place. She's in her 70s. She doesn't know how to work this technology and she doesn't have the capability right now with her diagnosis to learn this new technology. So we ended up going back to a paper calendar, which worked wonderfully well. And it was something that the client appreciated and knew. Yep. And that's the key. What works for them, not necessarily what works for us. Right. Because, you know, we all do things a little bit different. And that calendar, I'm sure, was ingrained in her memory forever. Because mm -hmm. that's how she lived her life. That's how she organized and stayed on schedule. And Alexa, I mean, you don't even know where it is in the room, you know. <laughs> when you're calling out to it. So, I mean, that can be confusing in and of itself there. Well, Bonnie, this has been a great conversation. Anything that we didn't cover that you guys are doing at Jewish Family Services of St. Paul? Well, we have many more programs. You know, we have the Pearls program. We have a counseling program. We have a wonderful chaplaincy program. We have a chaplain at Jewish Family Service that will go out and meet people and help them. We're not going doing face-to-face -face now, but of course we'll call. We also are in charge of wavered services. We have the Ramsey County wavered caddy waiver, and we have Medica and UCARE. And we provide elderly waiver for those clients. We have financial assistance. We have a volunteer program. I was going to ask you about volunteers. Is that something that you're still trying to coordinate or is that kind of settled down too because everything has changed? It's had its challenges because everything has changed. As soon as the pandemic hit, 
we did change that with volunteers call clients just to check in if case managers couldn't check in with everybody. Yeah, it's been it's been a bit challenging. However, we've used our volunteers at Jewish Family Service to help with things like delivering our packages for the holidays. During Hanukkah and Christmas, we delivered packages this year. And then we have the same group of volunteers that also help deliver our Passover packages. That will be coming up. Yes. Oh, great. That's wonderful. Now, what's the Pearls program? The Pearls program is a program geared towards people that have depression. There's caregiver coaching for that with people that have depression. They go out and they find meaningful activity for their clients. Wonderful. And I would think depression is kind of on the rise out there is what we're being told, you know, from the isolation for people and uh, the the job loss. And, you know, I mean, there's just so many, uh, the financial pinch that people are feeling in so many ways. Um, Well, again, thank you so much for your time today, uh, Bonnie, and telling us about Jewish Family Services of St. Paul. People can go to their website, which is JFSSP dot org that's jfssporg or you can call directly at 651-497-8248 if they need services that i've spoken about they can they can call that number if they need broader ideas they can call the general number which is 651-698-0767 So again, you can call the general number as well, 651-698-0767. And they're located at 1633 West 7th Street in St. Paul. But don't go there because they're working from home for the most part. And then, uh, Bonnie, do you want to give out an email? My direct email is B as in boy, Jaffe, J-A, F as in Frank, F as in Frank, E, at J, F is in Frank, S is in Sam, S is in So, P is in Paul, dot org. Okay, wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much for your time and being part of the Dementia Caring and Coping during the pandemic series through the Roseville Alzheimer's and Dementia Community Action Team. Have My a, pleasure. Have a wonderful week, Bonnie. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. So in wrapping up, you can always reach me at alzheimerspeaks.com or you can email at lori, L-O-R-I, at alzheimerspeaks.com as well. Have a blessed week, everyone. Talk soon. Bye-bye.